Nathaniel Philbrick's award-winning and New York Times best-selling books are filled with suspense, intrigue, and gripping plot twists. And since his subject matter is American history, every single word is true. That's the great thing about history for me is, you know, we have a tendency to look back and say, well, it was a simpler time and they knew what they were doing. No, it was as complicated and messy as it is today. Philbrick's new book, Valiant Ambition, George Washington, Benedict Arnold, and the Fate of the American Revolution, continues the narrative he began with the best-selling Bunker Hill. In Valiant Ambition, Philbrick explores the brutal middle years of the war and the tragic relationship between Washington and Arnold, two men who fought passionately for the same cause until one of them betrayed it. I guess it sort of began with my mother. When I was growing up in the 60s, she was a real Benedict Arnold fan. And, you know, I, I, I was like a little, what, Mom? You know, Benedict Arnold? He is the personification of evil. I mean, what are you talking about? She said, no, no, he got a bum rap. But even though Valiant Ambition gives Arnold his day in court, it also shows how each man's character ultimately determined his fate and the future of a new nation. The American people had come to revere George Washington, but a hero alone was not sufficient to bring them together. Now they had the despised villain, Benedict Arnold. They knew both what they were fighting for and against. Thank you so much, Nathaniel Philbert, for joining us. We're so happy to have you here. Well, it's great to be in this beautiful place. I mean, the critical reception's been fantastic. What are you feeling from your fans and your longtime readers? And It's been really gratifying. You know, this is now my, I don't know how many books I've written now, and it's been really fun to see how this one has resonated, because um, a, lot of, a lot of people discovered me through Bunker Hill. Uh, the book, my earlier book about the revolution. And so it's been fun to see them now, you know, uh, reading the next installment and, and enjoying it. And a lot of, been a lot of really interesting questions uh, at the signings. What compelled you to tell this story of, of Benedict Arnold and George Washington? Well, I guess it sort of began with my mother. Um, she, uh, when I was growing up in the 60s, she was a real Benedict Arnold fan. And, you know, I, I was like a little, what, mom? You know, Benedict Arnold, he is the persona personification of evil. I mean, what are you talking about? And she said, no, no, he got a bum rap. And my mom was kind of a renegade, and I think uh, that appealed to her. And it was after finishing Bunker Hill, and I knew that I wanted to follow Washington wherever he was going to lead me into the revolution, that I realized mom was right. Maybe, you know, uh, Arnold would be a good foil for Washington, someone who began the revolution very much one of his perhaps his greatest general, and then, of course, went, went the other way. And so uh, it all began with my mother, I think. Where did it begin for her, do you think? Is she just, was she just a, a history well, buff herself? Well, when I was growing up and... in the 60s, uh, uh, we, had, we were on Lake Champlain uh, in su summers, and I think you know, the whole uh, Benedict Arnold legacy there may have contributed. I think she probably read some Kenneth Roberts novels associated, you know, that, that sort of are very good about Arnold when he was at his best uh, fighting for the American cause. And so I think that may have contributed to, but mom was ornery and I think uh, it really, uh, she enjoyed going for the dark horse, so to speak. That's interesting, this sort of start, the story begins where your early childhood began. Yeah, absolutely, on Lake Champlain. I actually pretty much learned how to sail Lake Champlain. My first job was teaching sailing uh, at a day camp in Shalott, Vermont, uh, you know, right near where all of this happens. And so it was, it was quite, kind of amazing for me because in part of my research process, I got to go to the places. And so I rented a pontoon boat um, right in Valcour uh, on the New York side of Lake Champlain and went around Valcour Island where Benedict Arnold fought the, the Battle of Valcour, which is one of the great naval battles on a lake. Uh, you could argue that he actually saved America in 76 because the British had taken New York, Washington had been forced to retreat, and there was this big invasionary force coming down from Canada. And if they had punched through and taken Ticonderoga and made it to the Hudson, the British would have had that quarter of water and been able to seal off New England from the rest of the states. And so, uh, so Arnold was there. And so what, having you know, sailed there in my youth to return there in a research trip was, was, was really uh, very neat for me personally. 
we have so mythologized the American Revolution and the first thing you learn in Valiant Ambition is what a mess it really was. Yeah, no, I gr grew up, uh, I think w the way most people did, th assuming that the revolution was about a, a, a group of, of undisciplined militiamen banding together to defeat the mightiest po military power on earth and throw off the shackles of British tyranny. You know, that was the, that was the, the legend. And then to learn that, you know, the revolution was not, uh, each battle wasn't a stepping stone to a God-ordained victory. Uh, it went on for eight years, and for most of its, its time, it was directionless. It was a, a true stalemate where n nothing was really happening, and the American people were showing much more enthusiasm for fighting themselves fighting each other than fighting the British. Uh, it had devolved and truly to a civil war, uh, particularly around British-occupied New York and, and then down, eventually down to the south. And, and so it was, it was a very disturbing actual story. And uh, the big question was if Washington somehow manages to defeat the British militarily, will there be a country left to declare victory? One of the other big revelations is that George Washington was not yet the general or leader that we think of yeah, you know, absolutely. Today. Yeah, I grew up like most people with Washington on the one dollar bill, the the rock upon which this nation is founded, uh, the 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 pragmatists, you know, looking at at things very very dourly. But the reality is, is Washington in the first years of the Revolution uh, was in his early forties, red haired, and by temperament aggressive. Uh, during the siege of Boston, he wanted to attack the British that were occupying the city and, and burn Boston if, if necessary. A, a, a proposal that was repeatedly rejected by his council of war is too risky. And uh, at the Battle of Long Island, he kept putting his own army in harm's way when really he should have been on more of a defensive mode. But that was Washington. He, he was a fighter. Uh, by temperament. He would eventually learn, and this is where Washington is truly remarkable. I think most people have a hard time changing their behavior. Uh, and uh, Washington was learning under the most arduous circumstances anyone has operated under. And he realized, I may want to fight, but the best thing for my country is to, is to be defensive, not risk the army, do, fight a war of attrition and outlast the British. That's our only hope of winning this thing. And so he 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 was able to control his nat his impulses for the. And better you said of the and written that in many ways he and Benedict Arnold were very similar, but of course in very crucial ways they were very different. Right, and that was a surprise for me to realize that they had um, a real similarity. And I think there, there was a part of Washington that was even envious of Arnold. If he had been, if Washington had been ten years younger. Uh, he, and not saddled with the crushing responsibility of command, he could have been out there fighting those battles like Benedict Arnold. And, uh, but he couldn't, and, and, but he needed people like Arnold. And there was no one with a record that could really match Arnold's. And so Washington was very appreciative of his abilities. He, he realized that he was controversial. Uh, Arnold was very passionate, and those passions contributed to his charismatic presence on the battlefield. But when he wasn't in the middle of a fight, it, it could get him in trouble with fellow officers, particularly with politicians. But that was part of the package when it came to Benedict Arnold. And as you say, where we saw Washington evolve into a more mature and capable leader, we saw Arnold almost spiral into something right. worse. He was thin-skinned. And, you know, and he also had to deal with some pretty bad situations. Uh, you know, he is the hero of Valcour Island. Uh, that winter, he's quite rightly expecting a promotion to Major General. He's the highest ranking brigadier with the best record. But the Continental Congress, which is, is the ones that decide what Major Generals Washington will have, decides to institute a new policy where each state will have two Major Generals. And since Arnold's home state of Connecticut already has two, they chose in their wisdom to overlook Arnold for promotion and, and promote five generals passed him to major general and this you know this w angered him and it perplexed washington who immediately wrote arnold say look i don't know what's going on here but trust me i will do everything i can to support you in this and you know but arnold this became this began to change arnold he was like you know here i am i'm i'm doing all of this 
and I'm getting no respect for my own government. Why am I doing this? What drove Washington to power through all of that? We know he had some of his own personal sort of scores to settle with the crown. What, what kept him intact in that way? Well, you know, he had been overlooked for a commission in the British Army. And so, you know, that was obviously motivating him. Um, but, you know, and he was highly ambitious. And, uh, and, but, you know, that ambition was tempered by a realization that uh, you can't go out there and just want it. You have to earn it. And that was the extraordinary thing. He, you know, he, he, he went after glory through his actions rather than personal aggrandizement. And, you know, that's a very subtle thing. You know, I think all of us who are, you know, people who serve in government, the, it's a fine line between doing it for personal reasons and doing it truly for the good of the people. And I think Washington is the best example we'll ever have of someone who does it for the right reasons. But, you know, lurking there is a realization that he wants to be one of the, one of the most important people of his generation. And throughout this, he was actually sympathetic to Arnold, too, even though he was running this war. He looks to Arnold and, and I think has, you know, this is someone I can relate to. Uh, yes, he's kind of a controversial hothead, but boy, is he's exactly what I need on the battlefield. And so I think because of that, uh, Washington had a little bit of a blind spot when it came to Arnold. That even though he was loyal to George Washington, he still was able to engineer this betrayal. There was a, more than a little narcissism. In, when it came to Arnold, and it really helped him on the battlefield. He could convince himself that, you know, be, I'm gonna do this and everybody should follow me and we're going to achieve it. And it almost always worked out that way. And, but that quality helped him when it came to uh, the fact when, when he began to say, you know, hey, why am I doing this? Uh, our country is falling apart. The British have more respect for me than my own country. Uh, it's time the British came in restored the liberties we had prior to the revolution. And, you know, by, by my changing sides, I'm not, I'm not betraying my country, I'm doing what's best for them. And so he could convince himself of this. And so that when he is in the midst of feeding the, the British vital information about the, the American army, he's able to you know, out, uh, defend himself with, with great vigor because he's convinced, okay, I may not be telling the truth here, but it's for the greater good of not only Benedict Arnold, but the American people. And so it made him, he was hardwired to be a traitor uh, because it was, you know, he was absolutely convincing. Philbrick's books are packed with facts, but they read like novels with each chapter revealing critical details and fascinating characters who somehow escaped our attention during high school history class. In Valiant Ambition, we meet Peggy Shippen, Arnold's young, loyalist-leaning second wife, and her friend, Major John Andre, the young and charming British spy chief who would go on to pay the ultimate price for Arnold's betrayal. Yes, well, you know, Peggy is just a fascinating character. He is angry and, and just growing more and more embittered, and then he meets Peggy, 18 years old. She had loved it when the British had been there. She had socialized with uh, Major John Andre, and we have Andre to think, thank because he did a sketch of her, and she was just a gorgeous woman. And so they fall in love, and she says to Arnold, look, you know, look how you're being treated by your own people. You know, you know, what are you doing here? And, and I don't think it's, there's any accident that within a month of their marriage, uh, she, she uh, Arnold, sends his first feelers to the British, to none other than Major John Andre, who is in, in British-occupied New York and is now the British spy chief. Do you think this all would have happened without her still, or...? I think she uh, was a true catalyst. I think Arnold was embittered. Uh, you know, that never shook his loyalty, you know, it's strange. He, he really respected Washington. And, it's, and he's, he's married Peggy, he, I think he's wrestling with it, and he writes this letter to Washington. And you can only describe it as an hysterical letter. He's saying, you know, look what they're doing to me. If they're doing it to me, they're gonna do it to you too. And, and I think he's, he's there, he's fending, you know, Peggy's whispering in his ear, he's wondering what to do. And under siege. Under siege, and, and ultimately says, okay, I'll give it a try. 
And he doesn't initially, you know, they, and they go back and forth for a year before he fully commits, commits to this. But I don't, I think without Peggy, um, I, I don't know if it would have happened uh, because she really, clearly, it's, and it's clear from the correspondence, she, she really was there uh, uh, stage managing uh, much of this. But it's crazy to think, you, as you're reading this, you can tell that she has no clue what this will unfurl. Right. No, 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 no one, you know, you, you think, ah, well, this sounds like a good strategy. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll just bring the British in, you'll be a hero, and all will be well with the world. And, you know, the world is a fairly complicated place, and, um, uh, and it would ultimately lead in a very dark direction. But, you know, that's the great thing about history for me is, you know, we have a tendency to look back and say, well, it was a simpler time and they knew what they were doing. No, it was as complicated and messy as it is today. People were doing things for a variety of motives and, um, you know, they were making it up as they went along. And, um, and Arnold was in the midst of that, Peggy was in the midst of that, and Washington was in the midst of that. What was Washington's reaction when this all dawned on him, what had, what had come so close to transpiring. Yeah, it really is amazing at the end where it's cloak and dagger stuff. You cannot make it up. It is just, you know, there's a midnight meeting with it's Andre and, yeah. and, and then uh, Arnold's in his headquarters at a, a house right on the bank of the, of the Hudson just below West Point uh, when he gets a letter that Andre has been captured and he knows, oh my gosh, this will be revealed. And Washington is due to show up any moment now. And so he runs up to Peggy, says, look, I gotta get out of here. Uh, and he hops on his barge and is rowed down the river and eventually makes it to British occupied New York. Washington arrives and he's with Hamilton, Lafayette, Henry Knox, the three officers who, whom he's closest. And he gets this letter uh, that informs him that they've captured Major, General, Ma Major John Andre, and they have evidence that Arnold is a spy, has, has wanted to turn over West Point to the British. He, Washington turns to, to Lafayette, you know, just in his early 20s, French officer upon, who's become almost a surrogate son to him, and he says, whom can we trust now? And I think that pretty much says it all. It was, it just took the wind out of his sails. You know, the, the general whom he had supported so, so wholeheartedly throughout, the, over the course of the last four years, um, had, had turned traitor. And this is terrible to admit, but until reading this, I had always just assumed Benedict Arnold had been caught, but he got away. He got away. Major John Andre gets hanged, but Arnold becomes a brigadier general uh, with the British in New York. Uh, eventually is sent to Virginia where he burns Richmond. I mean, he was a very effective general on both sides. Did it ever sort of come back to haunt him in any way? Absolutely. He was a traitor in the eyes of the Americans, but he was also a traitor in the eyes of the British. He was tainted. And, uh, you know, once a traitor, always a traitor. And so there were some very difficult situations when he would end up in London where members of the nobility would turn their backs on him, make derogatory remarks. One point he would almost get into a duel over it. Eventually he ends up in Canada as a merchant. Uh, things go from pretty good to bad, ends up back in London. Uh, you know, just it's, it's, it's a sad, sad end to uh, a, really a truly a tragic tale. So when his betrayal comes to light, we find out just how close we came to losing what we've been fighting for. Right, and I, it's no accident that within a year would come the victory at Yorktown. Uh, because America could not have last. I mean, it. We just we were we were done. And uh, but I think that the, the Arnold moves to Virginia. Lafayette is sent by Washington down to try to get Arnold, and that begins the movement of troops that will ultimately result in the surrender of Cornwallis and, and ultimate victory. At the end of the day, what do you want your readers to walk away with? Or what impression do you want them to sort of walk away with from this, from reading Valley well, Division? You know, for me, this book, it's all about character. You know, it, ultimately it comes down to that. And um, sure, Arnold had his reasons to, to be sour on, on the cause, but it, you know, it also ultimately came down to characteristics in his personality that allowed that to happen. While Washington 
was experiencing many of his own frustrations, if not even more, but always held true. And I think those, that, that comparison for me, you know, it, destiny is character, and character is destiny, and, and that's really what Valiant Ambition's all about. Nathaniel Philbrick, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been really fun, thanks.